Welcome to the Book Talk Nation chat with Susanna Kearsley. Um, we are joined also tonight by Karen Holt, who will be our interviewer. Um, Karen Holt is a freelance writer and editor who reviews books for O oh, the Oprah Magazine, Parade, and other publications. Um, as you'll see, tonight will kind of be like a an author talk in a bookstore. So Susanna will talk a little bit about her book, The Firebird. Um, and if you haven't ordered that book, you can do that um, until midnight tomorrow night Eastern time and she will sign and personalize those books for you um, and then we will make sure to get them shipped right to your door um, by murder by the book in Houston so um, before we officially get started I'll let you know that there's also a chat box under this um, under this window and that's how you can communicate with Susanna during this chat so if you have any questions for her um, we'll be taking those questions in about 15 or 20 minutes so you can go ahead and start entering those now and then we will we will get to those reader questions in just about 20 minutes um, so I will go ahead and turn it over to Karen now and let the Q&A portion start thank you Jennifer so Susanna Kearsley is the best-selling, award-winning writer of 11 books. Her novels are a blend of the best in historical, paranormal, and romance fiction, earning her fans in more than 20 countries. So Susanna, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us this afternoon. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And I apologize if the, the sound or picture quality is, is off for some people. I know we've been jimmying with this all day trying to get the computer to, to work properly and my computer just hasn't been cooperating very much and we just had a big thunderstorm roll past yeah. so my apologies and hopefully everything will, will go well and if if I sound you know kind of fuzzy then just ask me to repeat and I'll do my okay. best okay great well so far you sound great okay uh, and as I said I, I, I'm just very excited that you're that you took the time to talk with us and I know a lot of people are very excited about I'm going to hold up the book cover here about Firebird um, your your 11th novel and I've seen you describe it as a sort of sequel to Winter right. Street and right. what does that mean? Well I didn't want to go ahead and write a straight sequel because I don't think that's really fair to my readers to say you know, if you want to read this book, then you have to go back and read the one that came before it. I don't think that's really a nice thing to do. <laughs> and I wanted to also write a book that would just stand on its own. And if you never read The Winter Sea, it should be just a, a self-contained story. And if you have read The Winter Sea, it should kind of, you know, carry on that story for you. But I didn't, I didn't want to make that demand on readers because I really didn't think that was a fair thing to do. So I purposely tried to structure it so that everybody was introduced new again and, and that you didn't have to have any past knowledge. If, if you do, I've, had, I've heard some readers in England describe it as kind of like, a, like an Easter egg. If you find this little, this little thing in there that, that relates back to either the shadowy horses um, or to the winter sea, um, because the hero of the present day part of the story comes from the shadowy horses, which was a much earlier book. And I've heard people say, well, you know, I've discovered this, and it's kind of like finding a little Easter egg in a, in a computer game, and it's neat. You know, you have that little little leg up on everybody else, but it's not really necessary to have read either book before you start with this one. Great. Well, there's something in uh, there's something called the psychometry or psychometry. How is that? Pronounced? Psychometry. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the plot, that, which is very important to the plot. Can you describe what that is and what the historical uh, research in real life sort of says about it? Oh, okay. Well, so psychometry was something that, that I discovered um, when I was doing The Shadowy Horses back in 1996. And I was writing about an archaeological dig, and I based the character of Robbie, who was eight years old then, I based him on a real-life man who purportedly had psychic abilities, uh, who had never claimed to, you know, never made a big deal about being a psychic, never charged money for it, never made it public, but his wife was friends with the wife of, of one of our top archaeologists here in Canada. And that archaeologist used to take this man, whose name was George, um, out on digs with him and walk him over the, the dig site, and George would be able to tell him things about the site that that uh, Emerson would then be able to confirm by digging, and I thought that was very cool. And the other thing that George could do is he could hold an object and tell you its relative age based on how cold or warm it was, and also tell you things about the people that had owned it and used it, and, and that was kind of an intriguing concept. So I started 
looking into that more and more, and, and I, I like to go back to university studies, because um, most universities in their psychology departments also have a sub-department of parapsychology, where they do this, this testing, and the things that you see in the, in the movies with the flashcards and the, all that type of psychic type testing, and, but a lot of it is very well documented, and it's really interesting. So psychometry is the ability to hold an object and pick up, you know, I, I guess the energy of the people that have, have used it or held it before, but to be able to, to divine certain things about the users or makers of that object by holding it. So this, this became sort of a neat little link because Robbie already had that ability. Mm -hmm. um, when I'd given it to him back in 1996, sort of with really good foresight, I guess, not knowing I was going to be writing this book. Um, but it, it became a neat bridge between the past and the present and sort of let him let him straddle both times, which which became useful to me. So. In in the book, there's uh, it, it's it's considered kind of a, a scandalous thing to talk about, and there's some persecution of people who have this gift. Is that right. also based on history? In Russia, yes. Um, in, in Russia, Nikola, who is the heroine of the, the modern day story, she has this ability as well, but she's always been taught to bury it, to hide it. And she's been taught by her grandfather, who was a young man uh, in the Soviet regime. And what they would do at the same time that the American government was running Project Stargate, with the remote viewing and the, the men who stare at goats is sort of, you know, like based on that. The, the, and there's, a, again, a lot of interesting documentation that came out of there. And a lot of the participants have, you know, written their memoirs and they still tour. And um, in fact, a couple of them were down this past weekend at the Ryan Research Center in, in North Carolina, which helped me a lot with, with my research for the book. Um, but the Nikola's grandfather in, in the Soviet Union would have been one of the many young men who were just taken and placed in uh, research facilities because the Soviets, like the Americans, were trying to weaponize psychic ability and were trying to see if it was possible to do this. And they were subjected to really horrible experimentation, mostly with mind-altering drugs with LSD, um, just terrible, terrible stuff. And, and it was completely involuntary. It was, it was not something that they really enjoyed. And it was something that Nicholas grandfather remembers with, with horror. So his, his advice to his, his granddaughter is, is never let anybody know you have this ability because terrible things will happen. Nothing good will come of it. So she's sort of been, been raised in this tradition, whereas Robbie, who is raised in Scotland, where the site is, is an accepted thing, is, has a completely different experience of it. So the two of them coming together is creates a bit of conflict. Yeah. Right, right. Well, as, as you say, uh, two, two, there, there are two love interests in this novel, and, and, right. and, and one of the, the love stories is between Nicola and, and Rob, and they both have this gift, and because of that, they're able to almost literally read each other's minds. Right. So was there something intriguing to you about the idea of a couple that had this extra level of intimacy? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I first encountered that in a book when I was 12, and I read Touch Not the Cat by Mary Stewart. I don't know if anybody else has read Touch Not the Cat, um, but Mary Stewart is one of my all-time favorite writers, and, and her hero, who was actually also named Rob, but I couldn't rename mine because he already existed from before, um, but I got him in the like, oh, it's got to be a book. Um, they, her hero and Bryony and Rob communicate telepathically, and I, I found that so neat, and it it, um, it really stuck with me that this is a, an interesting level of intimacy again, and, and creates its own problems, because sometimes they're reading your mind when you don't want them to be reading your mind, and how, you know, and it, it created a, a whole, you know, level of um, complication to the relationship that I found something quite, yeah, I found it quite neat to deal with, right. especially in their case, because Robbie is so free and open with it most of the time. Right, so. right. I mean, I do think in real life it would probably be hard to be in a relationship with someone who could literally read your mind. Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that would work real well in our house, um, you know, but uh, my husband knows me well enough, but, but luckily doesn't know every single thing I'm thinking, <laughs> and it's, pro it's probably a really good thing for everybody, but, but they are able to also block themselves, block each other out, they, they can, um, which from, again, from the research I've done and the, the first-hand accounts of people who claim to have abilities like that, it is, it is a possible thing, it's not like you're on all the time, um, that you can, you know, raise your defenses and not 
not take all that in sometimes. Um, but it, it was it was interesting to write about. It was fun. Well, in this book, as in many of your books, there are uh, two narratives: one a present right. in the present day, one in the past. What do you accomplish by intertwining the stories from these two different times that you couldn't do by just, you know, picking one time frame or another? Right. Well, part of it's just me being greedy because I, I like writing contemporary, but I also like writing historical, and I don't like having to choose between the two. Um, but also, when you're writing history, I find it really useful to use the, the dual stranded narrative because it, it allows me to craft a better arc out of the historical material. I'm really finicky. I used to be a museum curator, so I'm really, really finicky about my <laughs> use of the facts. If, um, if I've got a letter from someone that says they were standing in front of the, you know, the, the exchange at 12 noon on Monday the 3rd of May, then that's where they are in my book. I don't move them around in there. So um, I also can't you know, maneuver around where you know the, the actual facts of the story. But if I'm doing a dual time narrative, I can dip in and out of the history as I need to. If if there was a winter where people didn't do anything exciting, I don't have to take you through that whole winter. Um, I can just kind of leave you in the fall and then pick you up again in the spring and 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 uh, put some modern day stuff in between. But also, it allows me to bring in the historical details that the people of the time already knew themselves. So it, it, you avoid that, as you know, Bob thing where mm -hmm. characters in the past are talking to each other about something that they would never be talking to each other about because they both already know it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the history of the Jacobites is always a tricky one to bring up and because I wasn't doing this as a sequel to The Winter Sea, I couldn't assume that people reading it knew anything about the Jacobites or even cared anything about the Jacobites. They just have to know the amount they need to know for the story. So. I had to bring that in somehow, and, and in this book I accomplished it by having Colonel Graham, who's an older man, talking to an eight-year-old Anna when we first meet her, and giving her the history that way. But I have accomplished it in the past by putting it in the present day narrative, um, and in fact I'm doing it again in this book that I'm doing now, the, the one I'm writing now, which is another Jacobite thing that seems to be becoming a theme for me, but uh, I really love that whole period of history. so. I, I put that in the present day and have a character who doesn't know anything about it, like some of my readers, um, learn it naturally from from someone else in the present day instead of having the past people just go on about about it for convenience sake because that never feels right. You, you don't have to info dump as much if mm -hmm. you're if you're in and out of the past and the present that way. Plus, I think it's maybe a little easier for us to relate to. Um, the modern day character at the beginning and then get into the historical bit and, and sort of bond to her and let her take us into the past. Do you ever, do you ever find yourself sort of preferring one storyline over the other and just sort of wishing that you could stay there instead of having to go back? No, I, um, I like them both. I was really torn with this one especially. Um, I, I liked all the characters and it was really, it just kind of found its own natural balance. Um, I think when the when more things were happening in the historical segment of the story, then I was really happy and content to be there. But I was still kind of worried about how I left Robin Nicola in the present, wanting to get back to them. So I, I it, it just kind of it, it when I write, I I don't do a lot of planning. I don't do a lot of outlining, which drives editors crazy because I don't <laughs> hand them anything they can use. I just kind of they have to trust that at the end of a year or a year and a half, I'll have this book written. But I really don't even know. What the characters are going to get up to until they get on the page. So, um, I heard it described once really well by a historical novelist, uh, a Canadian, Thomas Riddell, who wrote, you know, back in the, the 60s and 70s. And he, he said that I know my family's going to all be together at Christmas, mm -hmm. but I have no idea what we're going to do between now and then. You know, I know where we're going to be at Christmas. I know what table we're going to be sitting at. And that's what it's like for me with the historical bits. I know where everybody's going to be, but I have no idea how they're going to get there. So, um, it. It's it's neat how for me it's always interesting too to do the two narratives and see where where it just sort of naturally will flip from the past to the present to keep me interested because mm -hmm. you know I'm sitting in a room by myself day after day after day for over a year writing it it has to keep me interested too. Do they ever actually what your characters do? Do they ever actually surprise you? Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> it's it's my subconscious, right? Mm -hmm. It's not. It, it worries my father, who's an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, very linear, and I can still remember the first time he asked me, um, 
you know, how do you how do you get your stories if you don't outline? How can you do that? And I said, well, it's like a movie running in my head, and I just kind of they talk and I listen to what they say and I write it down. He's like, okay, you know, <laughs> went into the next room and talked to my mother, and you could just hear, you know, hear like, something's wrong with her, or something really wrong with her, but. It, it, your subconscious is a lot smarter than your conscious mind, and if you just let it have free reign and, and lead the story, it'll come up with solutions that are a lot more interesting than than what you could have done if you had outlined it beforehand. For me, um, but the the characters when they get on the page and start moving, it is like I'm watching a film. It's like I'm kind of going around behind them and right. watching them interact and. Anna and Edmund in this one just surprised me at every turn. I, I had no clue what they were going to come out with next. And I, for example, I saw Edmund has a scarred hand, um, and I saw it like a film when I when he came on, and and uh, I just figured he's a you know he's an Irishman, he's a kind of fighter, and I figured he just got it from hitting somebody when when he was in a fight someday, and and he actually sat down in a conversation with Anna and was telling her how his hand came to be scarred. And, it would just came out in the conversation naturally, and I remember thinking, "Oh, oh, well, that's a, that's a much more interesting you know, <laughs> story than the one I had thought up for you." So, I, so sometimes your subconscious will feed you this really neat stuff, and it's usually for me, it usually comes out through dialogue when they get talking back and forth. But and yeah, your your books do have very intricate plots. So, how do you how do you end up in the right place when you're Characters are sort of running loose like that. I don't know. I just, um, <laughs> I, I know I should probably just say, well, yes, I meant it to be that way. But you know, like I, I, I remembered somebody once reviewing a book of mine early on, and they were, they were an English major, and they were saying, well, I really liked how you used that as a metaphor for this. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I intended to do. So sometimes it just, it just happens. And this is one of those. Firebird was one of those books. You get books every now and then. I've had three in my life that, that are just like gifts and they just seem to kind of come out of the ether and write themselves and um, I'm a very very slow writer I'm very slow it's, it's um, not very exciting to sit in my writing room and watch me work but with the firebird towards the end and mind you I did have a deadline which helped but um, I wrote 17 chapters in a month which I have never done in my entire life and it was because I just got so immersed in the story I just didn't want to come out and my family's walking around trying to remind me to feed them and, and you know it, it got I was just so deep in that story um, that it just went and and I find that like I say if I let that happen it just kind of naturally balances I I'm just fortunate I guess that way with some books that they just find their own their own pattern and it works I I think the history having the history to hang the story on probably helps a lot because in the back of my mind, in the back of my subconscious, I'm thinking, okay, well, I need to get them to Tuesday when so and so arrives, and this is going to happen. So I've got that little bit of a, a, you know, an external framework to hang it on. But it just seems to happen, and they just get mad at the right places, and um, you know, they just sort of drag me along with them, and it's a lot of fun. It's a fun way to earn a living, really is. Well, you do so much research ahead of time. Yeah. So which do you find to be more enjoyable, the research or the writing? Well, because they're, yeah. it's a never-ending thing for me, never-ending. And um, it's, I don't know, if you, you can probably see behind me, 90% <laughs> of those books are, you'll see flat, big flat brown envelopes mm -hmm. on top of some of the books in my shelves. Those are documents from the National Archives at Kew in London. And those are the original letters and, and journals and stuff that I order and read. And that, some of them I have to go over and read in situ. Some of them I, I spent a, an awesome week at the National Archives of Scotland just reading Thomas Gordon's letter book where he kept all his correspondence. And before he sent it to anybody, he would draft it out. He would write it. And it was fascinating because not only am I seeing his, you know, I'm touching pages that his handwriting is on, but um, I'm seeing what he meant to write and crossed out. I'm seeing the letters that he received himself and thought worthy of keeping, um, you know, the notes that his wife was, was giving him saying, you know, well, you're in Barcelona, could you please go pick me up this fan that I want, you know, and, and, it, and it brings the characters to life for me. And, and what happens is then I, I fill my head with all this stuff. Minor characters will sort of start, start appearing that I didn't know I needed until I got into this research material. Charles um, Gordon's uh, 
nephew is his his half brother's son. Um, I didn't even know existed until I read Gordon's letters, and Gordon was explaining his relationship to Charles's brother, and I thought, oh, that's a neat guy. So I've got another person in St. Petersburg now to bring into the plot. So I'll hit a certain point in the book, and and I'll realize from my research or from what's happening in the story that I need to learn about something else, and then I sort of take a little pause and I learn about that, and it brings me back in the story, I go a little further on, and so it's a never-ending thing, and that's probably why the the current book is about Jacobites as well, because it, it came out of that research I was doing for Firebird. It, you'd learn this other little thing, you go, oh, well, that's kind of, I never I never knew about that little incident, and you can't stop thinking about that now. So, um, But it, it's, it's amazing what has survived and what you're able to get. And you hear their voices in their letters. Mm-hmm. You get their rhythms of speech. You get the the things they said, the things they did, and, and I like to go back and piece their families together because I'm an amateur genealogist and, and have done that since I was born, our family does that all the time, so it's important to me to put all their family back together too, and then that again leads me in directions that I didn't expect to go in, so yeah, it's a lot of, lot of fun. So I think Jen wanted to, uh, to jump in here with some reader questions, I know we have some people who Certainly. are... Uh, dying to ask you their own questions. So, uh, Jen? Yes, um, we do have a, a few coming in here on the on the chat box. One was from Karen um, about your plot and writing where your story takes you, but it, it seems that you've already covered that with, Karen, with this Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a different Karen. Um, but we do have another question from Kirsten, um, and she would like to know, can you tell us what three books you consider your gifts? I consider my my gifts. Oh, Mariana was the first one. It was the first time I ever, it was my second book that I ever wrote. Um, But it was the very first time that I ever had that sensation that I I feel like you're channeling. It's the only way I can describe it. You go into your writing room and after about 15 or 20 minutes, it just starts flowing. And you you finish the day's writing and you look at the page and you think, oh my gosh, you know, I got, I, I can't believe I wrote that. And it's it's just this wonderful feeling every day. You don't know what the characters are going to do, but you know it's going to be a really fun experience. And you don't want to lo- you don't want to leave those characters behind. Um, so Mariana was one. The Winter Sea was the, was the second, and the Firebird was the third. And the one that I'm working on now is is sort of starting to feel like that for me. Um, usually it takes me a while to get into a book, and my mother, who is the only other person that reads the book while I'm writing it, she always says she can find the moment where it clicks in for me. She can tell from the way I'm writing, from the way that the words are coming onto the page when she's reading it, that I've clicked into the book. And with this new one, I clicked in on, I think, page two, which, again, is rare. So, you know, we'll we'll see. We'll see where it takes me. But it's it's a great feeling. It's not every... It doesn't mean the other books are bad. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy them or don't like them. And there are moments... There are always moments in the writing. Um when you get days like that or weeks like that or chapters that you just love. and um, But for a whole book to be like that is a rare, rare thing for me. And that's only happened the three times. And um, we do have quite a few questions that were that were in it ahead of time um, on the site when people signed up. Uh-huh. So I'll go ahead and pull a few of those. Um, let's see. Whoa. It's clear that you did a staggering amount of research. Were you able to travel to Russia? And that's yes. from LJ Roberts in Oakland, California. Hey, LJ. LJ, yes, I did. Um, I went to uh, St. Petersburg uh, with my mom. Um, my mom is a very good travel companion for me because she she knows that uh, sometimes I'll just stop dead and start looking at rocks and, and writing down notes, and that's, that's where I get all the, I don't just get all the sensory information for the scene, I, I, because you have to be on site to know what the, it sounds wonky, but to know what the air feels like, to know what smells there are, what sounds there are, what the, the road feels like under your feet when you're walking, and you really discover these little places. I discovered the, the benches on the Strelka while I was in St. Petersburg. I would never have thought of setting a scene there, um, but that became sort of one of the main places where scenes happen in the book. But I, I went with my mom to Russia. We went on a tour um, that was a study tour out of England led by a, a Charles Hind, who is a, an architecture expert. He's actually a, a curator of drawings. 
and I think Victoria and Albert. Um, and so he got us into a lot of buildings and museums that we would not have otherwise been able to get into because I needed to get kind of behind the scenes. Um, the only place I didn't get I got I got to go into, but I didn't get as behind the scenes as I would have liked. With, was the Hermitage, and to this day I haven't been able to connect with anybody inside the Hermitage to verify um, the exhibit that I set up there. And so I had to. I mean, I did a heap of research. I, they have very very good uh, documentation on their exhibit process and on the their their organization, and I was able to read all their press releases for their other. Pro you know, exhibits and things, but that's the only time that I haven't been able to actually physically connect with somebody there. Just didn't happen. I kept emailing and nobody emailed back. So I tried every avenue I could. Maybe someday someone will come back from the Hermitage and say, that is totally wrong. That is not the way we do an exhibit. But I, I also had to use a bit of my own museum experience and, and kind of extrapolate what I thought would be happening. But Russia, I was there for, I think we were there for about a week and a half. Uh, in September, and it was awesome. So we were there the same time that Rob and Nicola were there, in terms of time of year. And I went to Belgium. Um, I went to Ypres, where uh, the convent was that, that I sent Anna to. And, um, I've been through Calais. I did not go to Calais for this particular. I didn't go back to Calais, but I've been through Calais before myself. Then I went back to Scotland, um, and especially back into Eyemouth, uh, which has changed quite a bit since I wrote uh, The Shadowy Horses. That was 90. 95 when I was there doing the research for that one. So there's been quite a quite a change in the town. The fishing is all gone and everything. But I've got a very good friend there who uh, I was able to stay with, and we went. We we found a new restaurant for Robbie to take Nicola to, and and went and took pictures of the the lifeboat and got all that organized. And just to hear the the sound of the speech again is always fun. And she corrects all my speech too. It's just, she she gave Robbie his nickname because her husband Jimmy uh, gave. The, the hero of the shadowy horses, his his by name for town. Everybody in Imouth has a by name because there's it's a small community, and you might get six David Dougals living there, so you have to know who's who. So, um, the Margaret gave Robbie his by name, and then she made sure I made him speak proper Imouth through the book and, and uh, corrected my my Scots when I got it wrong. <laughs> Great, and we'll, we have a time for a few more, so I'll, I'll grab a couple more here. Um, let's see, Susanna, I adore your books and recommend them often, especially The Winter Sea. I'm an author who discovered my love of the written word by first being an avid reader. Thus, I wonder if you might share the names of your favorite books and authors, and that's from Kathleen. Oh, thank you, Kathleen. That's really sweet of you to say. Um, I have a lot of <laughs> favorite authors. My first and foremost, above everybody else, is Mary Stewart. I, you know, my mother was reading Mary Stewart's *This Rough Magic* when she was pregnant with me. And we figured that's kind of where it started. Probably, I came out wanting to know the end of that one, and that was that was just where where it started. Um, but definitely, anything by Mary Stewart. Um, I prefer the early mysteries to the Arthurian books, and also to her later mysteries. I just prefer the ones that go up to *Touch Not the Cat*. That's my my of hers. Um, I love Neville Shute's books, especially A Town Like Alice. That made a huge impression on me. Um, he's a very good storyteller and very hard to categorize. He does sort of romantic, spy, bit of everything, adventure, all kinds of stuff mashed in together. He's just a really good storyteller and I, I love his work. Um, I also like Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, I got into Kurt Vonnegut through my first boyfriend who was a big fan of him. and. Uh, introduced me to Cat's Cradle, and then from there I just sort of went on, and I, I really love Vonnegut's rhythm and his speech and just his, you know, his ideas and creativity. So I used to read a lot of, a lot of um, science fiction, Vonnegut and Asimov were, were up there. I love Agatha Christie. I love the way she can do um, characters very economically. She can give you a couple of lines and you can see that whole character. And I just, I have all of her books, so I've read and reread and reread them. And I also like um, Jan Cox Spees, who's an American writer who wrote four novels before she died at an early age. And um, she wrote two Scottish historical romances that remain sort of, again, at the top of my heap of books that, that I would recommend um, Bride of the McHugh and My Lord Man Lee which if you can find them and read them, they're just utterly unforgettable. Really, really nice books. I just, so I love her stuff. 
and uh, but you know I was shaped by a lot of different influences. Um, Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> you know, odd as it sounds, there's a lot of the the way that A. A. Milne did his dialogue. That if you read my dialogue, you'll probably see the influence in there because he, you know, sort of like a that she said is is the whole point of it. You know, and and it, he was very very good at at his conversations and. I just and relationships. I'm all about relationships, right? About you know families and, and they're very complicated little relationships in Woody the Pooh, and I, I just love that book. So I you know I've been I'm Canadian. I grew up reading the Anne books. My favorite is Rilla of Ingleside, followed by the Blue Castle. They're sort of my my two favorites. But yeah, I could go on. I mean, they're all they're they're most of them are here. Most of, I I didn't really throw out. A lot of my books, much to my husband's dismay. In fact, if you don't tell him, behind the books you see is at least one more row of books that you can. <laughs> and you know, he's convinced our entire house is just going to tip over and fall into the swamp and sink because I, you know, I, I just won't give anything away. Um, but when I find a book, it becomes a friend, and I just read it again and again and again. And and I have e-books as well that. You know, thankfully you can fit a lot on the e-reader without toppling your house over. But I just, I just love, I just love stories. So I read really widely. I read a lot of different stuff. I don't just read in one genre. I read all over the place. Excellent. Well, that that's going to bring us right to our 7:30 mark. Um, oh no. So we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up now. But I want to okay. let everyone know that that's joining us that you can still order a signed and personalized copy of Firebird. Um, for those of you who, who aren't able to see Susanna while she's on her limited U.S. tour, you can order that book right here on this page. Um, on the, the little button there and sign and personalize it. And then Murder by the Book in Houston will ship it right to your door. Um, I want to give a big thank you to everyone who joined us and also to Susanna and Karen. It was a, a pleasure to have you guys tonight. Thank you very much. So, well, thank you so much for having me. And, and anybody who didn't get their question answered, if you want to shoot it to me, I'll happily answer it and get it back to you. Great. Thank you, Susanna. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice night.